Welcome to a new edition of the Bandwagon Podcast. And today um, I've got a guest on who was one of my kind of aces in my sleeve. Um, he was one of my hit list kind of guys. And um, I just thought, I think the timing was right just to kind of get him on and uh, just get his opinion on things, really. So um, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Dips Bamra. How you doing, Ethan? You all right? I'm all right, man. How are you? I'm all right. Just uh, celebrating my second birthday. I was just going to say that. that you just nicked my first joke, innit? I go, it was your birthday yesterday. And, uh, <laughs> well, allegedly on Facebook, you're like the queen, and you've got two, is that right? Well, I mean, you're not a proper dissy one day if you don't have two birthdays. At least, yeah, January the 1st. Yeah, true. Geez, uh, it's just mad. So literally, what was it? It was Sunday, yeah, Sunday yesterday. And um, I'm just getting happy birthday messages on Facebook. I was like, what's, that? what's going on here? And um, somebody had posted on my dad's original happy birthday post for me, which was 12 weeks ago. They um, decided to belatedly wish me happy birthday. Then somebody else wished me happy birthday. Then I was like, getting tagged in it. I was like, this is mental. I'm getting like hundreds of messages saying, bro, happy birthday. And then you had some of my cards on there as well. Like people I'm related to going, happy birthday. I'm like, you messaged me happy birthday two, like, three months ago. What's wrong with you? And I think that's how it, this is how that happened because I messaged you going, "Oh, happy birthday!" And, and, then, and then you played it and played along, and I got I got reeled in straight away. And then I felt like a right prick afterwards. Going, oh God, I've been done like a kipper here, and it, and then, it's, uh, it's Monday, and it's still happening, man. It's just it kind of puts the world into perspective. It's like I mean, love to everybody. Thank you to everyone who wished me happy birthday again. But it's like we live in a world where it's like likes over logic. Like, I have to, oh, someone's birthday. I have to say happy birthday. Well, you did. Like, months ago, just chill. It's, it's good. You don't have to be first with everything. So uh, it's lazy, yeah. isn't it? It's lazy. It's just like how um, social media is, is like, it, I think that's a really good example of uh, kind of like sheeple. Everyone, like the one person, because I did it. Yeah. I saw it. I saw it on there. And to be fair, I actually saw your post where you're thanking everyone for the birthday. And I went, oh, shit, it's dips. Oh, it's fucking dips. I better, <laughs> I better, I better, I better ah, go back. But if you, if you read it properly, I was like, thank you very much for all the birthday messages. I genuinely didn't expect anything today because it yeah. wasn't my birthday. Yeah, uh, I didn't get that far. I just, <laughs> yeah, for, for me, it just got clocked on. Netflix was going on in the background. I thought, I'm going to get back and watch Lupin. Uh, and, uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Yeah, no, Thank no, you very much. No, 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 that's cool. Dips, like... For me, yeah, like you're like that, uh, you're like that canary in a coal mine, like a, an indicator uh, for me of about uh, like a litmus test. So there's three tests I've just given there about um, uh-huh. of what like the Punjabi Pangra scene is is like. Um, and I think it's fair to say that when you talk about people who've had music in their family, there's very, you have very few families of, uh, especially from UK Pangra. Mm-hmm. where they've been kind of born into it so like for those people who don't necessarily know your kind of journey into it can you just share share with us about how what your journey was into uh uk pangara royalty um so um my i, I guess it all boils down to my old man uh so my dad is ks pangara uh from uh, the band up nice indeed um, he's a vocalist, musician, writer. Um, he's been doing this since 1979. Um, and I popped along in 1981 and through him, um, and just seeing his life at the time, um, uh, it, yeah, music's just been around. Um, and it was never a guarantee that I was going to do it or nor was I forced into doing it or told you had to do it. Um, but yeah, it's just the influence of, I think for me, the, the most exciting thing was at that time, obviously, you know, no social media back in the eighties. So for me, it'd be like, so dad, where are you going today? So like on a Saturday morning, oh yeah, we've got a show in Manchester in the morning and then the evening we're in Bradford and then on Sunday we're here and then, you know, on Monday we're in London and I'm like, okay, cool. And then the van will come and pick him up and I'm like, imagining what it would be like, what that van trip would be like, like what's the venue going to be like? I'm what, seven, eight, nine years old. And I'm doing this religiously every Saturday morning when they come to pick him up. 
Um, and then once he'd go, I'd put on an old VHS of them performing and I'd mimic the whole set. You know, I set up all my instruments. Um, it just felt like an adventure. And, you know, to have a, to have a little taste of that would have been enough for me. Um, and then when I did get a taste of it, when I joined up Nursingi in 1996, um, yeah, I just, yeah, I got, I got roped into it, hook, line and sinker, and uh, kind of been doing that uh, ever since, just been part of the music and media scene ever since. So as you, as, you, as you were growing up then, so your dad is obviously spending a lot of time on the weekends, like doing the gigs, and um, and then your, was your like your musical kind of first being quenched during the week when he was like, did he start trying to teach you or was he trying to get you away from the music scene at that point? No, he was, he, with him, I, was, I mean, he's always said it, um, you know, there was, there was a natural ability there um, and he wanted to cultivate that. So, you know, he'd teach me, um, you know, music at home. Um, he'd put me into music classes with uh, Ajit Simatlashi. Uh, we started Jeet Singh Matlashi, who I, who I learned Dabla from. And, um, you know, I used to go to Bhangra classes as a kid. Um, so always doing something. It was like, you know, like literally those five days during the week after school were, were planned and locked off. And, you know, we didn't get to see him much. Like, he never came to watch a football match that I played in. Never. Yeah, he was never there um, because he was gigging all the time. You know, when you're... At that point, there were like five, six gigs a week, right? Uh, even the tours, so you can imagine they'd go to Canada, for America, wherever for like two, three weeks at a time. You'd get one phone call per tour, and that was it. So like, you see your dad go, you'd be like, I don't know when I'm going to hear from him. I don't know what he's doing. What's Canada like? Which part of the, like nothing. And you get a two minute conversation. And, you know, that really, really, influenced me and just to be honest it just intrigued me even with the radio stuff like yeah. i'd be intrigued with the radio listening to how is this happening like how is that sound coming through the speaker so mm. intrigue was something that that kind of spurred me on to do work whatever bits and pieces i'm doing now i mean it's interesting that you're saying like even though in his absence the, the connection to your music was still was still there um and you were finding any way to try and like kind of develop it I mean, then, yeah. go on, sorry. No, no, no. And, and the thing is, it, it wasn't just through him, because obviously, like, in the 80s, there were so many other acts that were just popping up, you know, and so much music was out there. And, you know, I'd be like, okay, so what have they released? And what have they released? Are they any, are they better than my dad? Like, are they better yeah. than my dad? You know, you, you kind of do stuff like that. And, you know, I was just taking it as much music as possible. Um, and not just fun with that music, um, you know, like, Sounds of Bollywood in of, of the eighties, you know. I used to listen to a lot of that through through from uh, through like my mama and stuff. You know, it made me a VHS of just songs, Bollywood songs, and you know, literally I'd wear those cassettes out. You know, three hours, rewind, play again, and that that'd be my weekend. What do you think the what was the uh, atmosphere that? Um, I mean, I'm trying to go through you and your dad in, in terms of this podcast just to start off. <laughs> Rest assured, this guy's done a lot. Um, the the atmosphere and the energy around at that time from um as a punter or you know growing up uh, you know i was from hansworth in that way um there was all this camaraderie there was you know friendly competition you know people took pride in the work that they were doing um and uh, and you know you could see that from your own youtube channel when you put videos up and it you know it's like actual gold as of how unified the scene was that at that point you know people were jumping on each other's tracks uh, backing vocals a lot of the same um um music companies roma especially that you know that really just brings to mind um yeah. that journey then as a kid um knowing about having that inside information of that atmosphere and energy you know that that must have been really really unique just to kind of you it was really exciting man like again the word that keeps coming to my mind now thinking about this was just the intrigue of what's going to come next so they did that song and that album and that album did this for them and you know that put them on this level so what's what are they going to come with next uh what outfits are they wearing uh oh, who's joined the band now so all these things, intrigue 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 you know that was that was what made it exciting what's next what's coming new what's going to happen next what's the new sound how are they going to change things and that was good um 
and again, like I think just the way life is now, that 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 intrigue is missing. Yeah. And it's a catch twenty two situation. You have to tell people what you're doing. You have to show what you're doing. So kind of half the cat is already out the bag, really. Um, but back then, just to the way life was, the the intrigue was was what got me. Man. I, I just loved it. I loved it. Uh, even to this day, I love it. You know what's happening on the scene now, um, uh, and the new artists. I love it. You know, um, and and it, it should just continue. I think. Uh, there were periods where artists and people are a bit wary of each other. Um, nothing to be wary about, man. Just go out and have fun. That's what they did. That's what we should be doing now. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, you know, that I'm not trying to say it in a, in a condescending way, but that, you know, you can see, like, I don't think I've ever seen a video footage or a picture of you that kind of smiling. It's that you've always got that happy-go-lucky kind of looking for the positive in, in that way. What was, like, I always have these discussions with my with my nephew, especially um, that about that experience of actually going to a shop, not knowing when there was a release date. The only kind of uh, information that you had then was either from Aparapajan who took everyone's photo, yeah. or or, the, or there was uh, you know he used to have an Aparap video, he used to have the counter with the cassettes there. Yeah, you, you would just go in there and say, "Oh, this is the new one here, two pound fifty. Yeah. You know, here's your cassette." Yeah, blah, blah. Cassette. So, yeah, so. Do you feel, you know, how do you feel that experience is now from, like, in comparison to going to buy a tape, for getting it, compared to, like, just pressing 79p on a, on a phone and getting a digital stream? Pros and cons of everything, isn't it? Um, to be able to have access to music like never before is incredible. Um, to have the ability to literally hit shuffle on a playlist that you've created Although imagine that in the 80s or the 90s or the 2000s, that would have been incredible. Um, but yeah, the the hustle and the excitement of going to to a record shop, flicking through, um, you know, someone like um, someone like a Jags Climax, uh, who's a good friend. You know, he, he you know he's told me stories of he's a guy in South London who would catch the bus to catch a coach to come to Soho Road, to hit the shops in Soho Road, to see what vinyls he could get hold of, calling the shop beforehand, look, I'm coming, can you hold that vinyl for me? And then buying it and then catching the coach or the train to go back to South London. That, that's commitment, man. And we, we all did that, you know? Um, I remember my dad used to have a record shop on, uh, in Hansworth on Rookery Road. Opposite my uh, school. It was opposite your school. Yeah, yeah, Rookie Road. There used to be Gatan Mal and, uh, yeah, 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 and, and your dad. Uh, and I, remember, I remember he had one poster, he had one picture on there when it was, it was Gatan and then Winnie was on it. I think either one Thor of the Blasters. Thor Blasters. Yeah, yeah. yeah the original a, Thor Blasters. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, was, that was a classic. I used to see that at lunchtime looking yeah. at And then used to be like, there was a few of us with Pongra heads at that time. Yeah. Used to, at lunchtime, used to look out and see who's going into the studio, who's coming back. It was that was the that was the exciting times. Again, for you, like you know, you're looking through those school bars, going, "Can I see someone? Can I see? Is anybody mm. like? Can we, oh, yeah, I saw Safri, or I saw the next man. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. that fun, that fun element, I think, is is missing. Um, but again, the the ability to interact now with artists is 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 a touch away. That you know that that's the positive as well in in mm. some form. I think. With anything, you can look back and go, the 80s and the 90s were the best. They were great. Of course they were, but there were terrible bands in the 80s, man. I could give you a whole list of artists who were absolutely atrocious. Not every, let's not get it twisted. Not everything in the 80s and 90s was brilliant. It was not. Um, however, if you don't have the ability to evolve, and that's something, that, that's a hard lesson I learned probably about 10 years ago, like easy, you need to evolve in how you think, how you approach. Um, you're going to get left behind. Um, and I think with anything in life, you've got to evolve. You've got to go, right, if that's where life is now, how can I use that to my advantage? How can I use that to, to progress? How can I use what we have now um, to, to support others? Um, and I just don't think a lot of people in our industry have done that or have the ability to do that. Um, and that's just something that I want to 
continue to develop because mm. you know technology and human life <laughs> it's, it's, it's only going to get tighter yeah. um and we don't know how the scene's going to change in the next five years look how much it's already changed like everyone was scrounging around to get itunes cards to get 75p downloads and five years later it, it, there's no point because you can stream it all we don't know what's going to happen in the next five ten years time but whatever happens you've got to learn to evolve you've got to learn to adapt and that's the only way that you're going to progress in in this career yeah i i mean um like i'm not qualified at, at this point to kind of talk about any kind of mu- uh, musically on a pioneer level or kind of an expert i'm just talking about from a punter and just my opinion i think but this is the thing now you're a punter you have every right because you're the one just like me uh, don't listen again i keep saying this i am a fan of this music and this scene and this culture who happen to be born into a family where the father ended up doing it uh, and I happened to be good at something that became my career like strip all that back if I had to go and stack shelves for a living if I had to go and you know become an IT technician I'm still going to buy the music I'm still going to stream the music I'm a fan just you me there's no difference mm. so your so you saying your opinion is not valid. It's a hundred percent valid. Of course it is. And, you know, I think having opinions and expressing them is important. Again, that's, you now have the ability to do that, you know, mm-hmm. through social media. And I think any constructive um, points to artists should be taken on board. You know, when I talk about evolving, this is part of it. Now the audience can directly message and say, Giza, I loved your tune, or listen, I loved your track. I didn't feel it this time. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. You know, we all, all our opinions matter. It's just really being an idiot. Do, do, you, do, you, do you feel that the scene is, con- is mature enough to have that constructive advice? Like, for example, you're, it's okay to be a Siddhu fan and a Karanodala fan. It's yeah. like that. It's like that. Messi and Ronaldo, you know, you don't have to sit in camps, like you could be just like a pundit. But I just feel like nowadays is like just going back to your your example, you know, where the artists back in the day, for example, yeah, um, they were still elusive, you know, like I was talking about looking through the bar, they, they were almost that you know, you just see see them go past. And I think people don't realize the magnitude of how big some of those bands actually were, you know, like they're huge, they're massive massive and so like you know just how much how elusive those people are, you could hardly see them now because i feel that the scene is kind of in some areas in the uk it's, it's like kind of shrinking that it's it's easier to have that connection with the artist and get to know them really really quick and sometimes you know i you know that phrase of like never meet your heroes or never meet this because you know i've experienced it a couple of times like abroad even as well and you're like Oh man, I wish I did it, man. You know, I, I was like, I used to, I used to like that guy, <laughs> and then you're just like, oh man. It, it, I think, I think sometimes it can get, it can, it can taint the experience. And yeah. I, I just, I just crave being back that punter again. Um, again, you can like there's, again. There's nothing stopping you as a punter to create your own playlist and share it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like. If you were the same guy who used to take, um, you know, uh, a blank cassette and do a mixtape, and if you were the same person who used to get, a, you know, a blank CD and do mix CDs, why can't you be the same guy 20 years later who's uh, putting together a playlist? You know, these are my tunes. These are the, these are the bandwagon playlist you know what i mean why can't you do that it, there's nothing stopping anyone from doing anything other than mindset that's the only thing and you know i keep hearing over and over again the scenes this the scenes that the scenes this the scenes that what time? <laughs> like i you know what no it's not i am somebody who's been doing this since the age of what 15 mm. just like my father who came over in 1979 who has managed to feed educate, water, clothe us, educate us about life. He done that through Bhangra music. I'm doing the same now. So it's not dead. It's a mindset thing. And if you're not creative enough, I, I can't help you. Oh, actually, no, I can help you. 
you just got to reach out. And if you yeah. can't be bothered to reach out, uh, then I can't help you. Yeah. Um, and there's plenty of other people who can do that. So look, the scene is still great. Like, you, I don't care who you are, you still have to come to the UK to be a star. If you can't sell out the UK, uh, whether you're from Canada or America or India, you know what I mean? star Hey, if you come to the UK, this is where you're going to be a star. Um, you know, you can't tell me people like JK isn't a star. You know, if you look now, people like Prince and Raf Zabera, you can't tell me these guys aren't firing. Of course they are. Um, you know, there's a new female artist, Simi called Bambi Baines. They're stars. They just have, it's just that they've started their journey now. Um, and I look forward to seeing how their journeys progress because I think there's, ex there's, there's exceptional talent here. Um, as much as we love the 90s and, and the 2000s and the 80s, you know, we've got to kind of leave that there now. Still respect it, appreciate it, acknowledge it, inform people about it. But you've now got to try and get people to go, okay, who's next? Who's next? Who can I get behind? Who, you know what I mean? I, I think that's the mind. Everything boils down to mindset. Yeah, I think just to just going back from what I meant by being sh shrink, uh, like it shrinking. I think what what I'm what I feel like is that you know, especially with like Twitter earlier on, you know, on Twitter you were able to see like Bangla heads coming to the forefront. It it was there, and and I think that was they, it was almost like a collective at that point. Um, and then like you could just see people kind of like just just falling away, not being as active as they were, and. Maybe that's just a mistake that I kind of made where you think like, oh, in, not being active, it means inactive. So, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, yeah. Take, I'll, I'll take that point on. I think people get mardy. That's just human nature, isn't it? Like, uh, you know, having a Twitter handle means you're open to A, giving your opinion or B, receiving an opinion. And then it's up to you to how you deal with that. Now, when I started presenting, um, I used to get enough grief about my Punjabi skills on air because it wasn't BBC Punjabi. It's not what people were used to hearing. It was the Punjabi that you and I speak when we're at home with our mates, when we're out and about. It's half English, half Punjabi. You know, let's call it street Punjabi. But when I had to do a serious interview, ain't nobody telling me that I can't do it. Of course I can. And I've been doing it for what, nearly 17, 18 years, nonstop with the BBC, now, there's not many people that can say they've done nearly two decades. Um, it's how you deal with the criticism. You, so what I did was, okay, so if I, if I was accessible to have a complaint or an opinion delivered to me, I can either get Moody and Marty and go, yeah, so what, I don't care. No, I didn't, okay, how can I improve? Mm. Go and ask my dad, dad, what about this? What can we do? How can I say this? Okay, cool. Listen to other people. Watch other people. Um, hear what they've got to say. Learn. Like you're all, Even now, I listen to podcasts that range from conspiracy theories to real dictators to football to WWE. I'm constantly listening, A, for enjoyment, and B, to learn. And, and this is my question. And, and I think some people are just like, I don't want to do it. And then they stop becoming active and then it all kind of falls away. My thing is everyone's entitled to an opinion, especially if you're a public figure. And, you know, you know, touch wood, probably tempting fate here, but, you know, I don't have to worry about the messages I get. I'm quite happy with them. They're usually quite fun and, and engaging. And yeah, man, there's a lot of, there's a lot worse that could be, yeah. you know. There's apart a lot, from it, almost, apart so from much the ones. Apart from your Liverpool ones, all the other stuff is fine, isn't it? Um, while, you, while, you, while you just mentioned it, what's the most interesting conspiracy theory that you're in, involved? Oh, the, the one that comes to mind is the harp. The harp? The harp. Harp's cool. No, not harp's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, no. I, I said to her, I go, she is the UK version, potential version of like Lily Singh. That's my she, prediction. She's incredible. She <laughs> is um, someone who I have a lot of time for. Um, and a lot of, you know, I just wanted to do, I just wanted to succeed. Mm. Again, so for example, here we go. When Harps was announced that she's come to the Asia Network to do weekend breakfast, I had a handful of messages come through that day saying, 
oh, you've got to be careful. You've got to be careful, man. Like she'll she'll want your job and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, true, true, true. Okay, <laughs> cool. I thought, like, okay. And again, falls down to mindset. And that was a point where I'm thinking, maybe that's the case. Maybe that's what's happening here. She used to do a bungra show up north. She's come here kind of holding the fort breakfast. Maybe that's kind of thing. Um, and once I spoke to her, chatted to her, everything, I actually told her. I said, half, oh, I've got, you know, I have to tell you this. This is what people were messaging me. And she goes, why? I'm like, oh, I don't know. But it, I'd rather just be straight with you. And in the shortest space of time, now I'm talking about every Asian mainstream presenter. So whether it's, uh, and, you know, Anita Rani or Adol Ray or, or Nihal or Bobby or whoever it is, anyone who's dipped their toes into mainstream, her rise has been the shortest and the most impactful. Like what she's done in the space of three, four years, incredible. And from having messages telling me to watch my back, I can't be, I, I can't tell you how proud I am of her. Mm. I want her to succeed. I want her to be better than me and better than everybody else. because She deserves it. Yeah. Um, and anyone who works hard, anyone who's willing to sacrifice um, deserves success, man. I just want to be at the side now going, smashed it. Well done. Yeah. It, it's crazy because I, I, uh, I did get into a bit of a conversation with, um, online and I was saying like, you know how like, my kids watch, um, watch her on BBC. Yeah. And, uh, I remember all the programs that I remembered and I was like, just for a second, I was like, for how many kids you're going to be, you're part of their childhood and that's going to be with them forever. So it's just, oh, you really? know, and uh, I did put on a bit of pressure. I said, no, no pressure on that. And it's like, make sure. Yeah. You know, okay. So go, going back to the harp then, what is yeah. that conspiracy? Uh, so yes, yeah, so I Google it. Um, so the harp is, um, it's, it's a place in America uh, which, uh, it, when you look at it, it just looks like a massive electrical grid. And nobody knows why it's there, what they're doing with it. However, the conspiracy theory is that they are able to control the weather. Okay. This. Or like chem chemtrails, that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, uh, and then there's also theories of it's there to shoot down, you know, UFOs. UFOs. And all that kind of stuff, but yeah, check definitely check out the half man. I like I like a good conspiracy theory. There's a market there and it does see conspiracies. Like <laughs> how, how how good is actually Haldi? Thank you. Yeah, especially after a football injury and you have a Haldi Ali Roti that you put on your ankle, <laughs> in it? Yeah. How, <laughs> yeah. Does, I got it tiger bar, man. Let's not get it twisted. Does, I'm not gonna do nothing. <laughs> does Vix treat and cure COVID? Yeah. Is Lucozade only effective in a bottle? Yeah, a glass, glass, bottle. glass bottle. Yeah, <laughs> there's, yeah. There's, I think there's a few desi you could come up with, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> listen, they, 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 you're, you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to leave the house after if you just sneezed. Well, actually, you know what? There was uh, so when was it on my birthday? I made a wish and I wished for something, and uh, it didn't happen. And I said to my missus. Don't ever tell me to make a wish. Yeah. So nothing happened. Oh, it's I ain't doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, there's a there's a few man. Uh, shoes like not the not the right way around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay, let's go. But I'm just gonna try and reel it back now. Um, so you, you obviously you started your musical journey, and then how ha, how was your journey into opera singing? Now I just want to point out this bit. Did you join when it was Apra Sangeet or when it when it was Apra Group? Apra Group. So, and this is the maddest thing, and it blows my mind even now. I am technically the third longest um, member of the whole thing. So, the band originally started in 1983. So my dad and Sadara left Pachangi. Uh, Kalsi joined them on Tavla. Kacharamal joined them on Paul. Uh, Apna Pajan was there as well uh, on backing vocals. And they got a couple of other musicians here from Trak Pachan, Nikki and Kang. And that, that unit of six produced 10 albums in 10 years. And in 95, decided to call it quits. 
and they decided to call it quits and that that was it and what ended up happening was people were just calling like my dad and Sadar and say listen don't break up the band now you want to go out on top just uh, what, like in wrestling just one more just one more yeah go on buddy <laughs> and then then it kind of got to the point where it was like listen why don't you two get together and just carry on so they were like all right we'll give the original members first refusal um and I think Kalsi, Ontobla, and Gajaran Mal, they go, look, we'll, we'll come with you. Um, so it's your band now, and we'll, we'll come with you. Um, they, they sourced the drummer. And the original keyboard player, actually, for Arkana Group was uh, Nick Chowlia. Um, um, he's in the Kanda now, isn't he? Yeah, so he Red, joined, Is it Red FM? Red FM, man. Oh, yeah. Top geezer, man. Top lad. And uh, so he joined. And... Um, I think he was he was struggling a little bit um, because what see this is this is things I learned afterwards like when you're joining an established band who have got hits who have got songs that people know you gotta be on it and if you're not on it you're gonna it's gonna be tough um, and he I think he was with them for a couple of months and he was just like look this, this isn't for me kind of thing and everything was cool it was right. Um, but they were stuck. It was a, a bank holiday weekend in August, uh, 96. And uh, it was like, oh, we ain't got a keyboard player. It's bank holiday Monday uh, that weekend. And uh, they were like, my dad goes, look, my lad's here. He can play a few things, right? It's probably as good as Ross Geller and friends. Um, let, what we'll do is we'll take him for this weekend because the following weekend, he's going to start year 11. And then we'll find someone else. And they're still looking. <laughs> so, so <laughs> was this before or after? And it, it confirm or deny this is true. I remember hearing this um, when I was driving from a motorway once. I remember it, that you were smuggled into a gig at the Dome in a doll case. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, shit. So I thought I have my own conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I heard there, there was a gig. No. In, in, at the Birmingham Dome, and you were put, you were hid in it like a Mourinho star, hid in it because you <laughs> because you were underage. You were okay. underage. But no, no, no. So that was so it's okay. part true. Part true. The only bit missing was the board case. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been sick. That's yeah. the thing I would have gone for. Now, um, so yeah, so that was the very first Asian Pop Awards. So 1987. I'm six years old. And I really want to go. Um, so my dad asked Amajit Sidhu, who, who did the awards, and he kind of uh, said, look, bring Why him... Why Kaya? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He goes, bring him to the side entrance. So you can imagine, like, it's the night of the very first Pop Awards. Every band is there. Everyone's looking dapper. And me and my mum, like, we're standing at the side door at the door, just waiting to see if it opens or not. And it opens his arm Jitsu do. And he goes, Ben, you get that Take him straight upstairs. There's a balcony there. Just hide there. So we legged it upstairs. And I just camped on the floor and watched the show. So my first club night was age six. But I want to be in a door case now. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. I... No, it's, not, it's, not, it's not funny. Originally, it was fun. Now you mentioned the door I know, case. I know. Now he's just killed it because I was like, that is. <laughs> Sick, man. I want to move in it. I got this kid was killing it. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, being in a club, um, age six, going on seven, man, that was mad. I still remember that 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 um, that event like it was yesterday, man. It was, it was incredible. And and who was like uh, who was kind of like performing at that time? Was it like every band? Of, what was it uh, like? What was the actual format of them from what you remember or what you knew later? Oh, on? geez, I know it off by heart. So, um, it was. Um, there was three Pangra teams, so uh, and there was another team as well. They all performed together for the very first time. So there were three Pangra teams performing for the very first time. You had um, Sangam, who were the opening act, um, which featured Jazz Tami's dad. He was part of the band Sangam. Uh, there's a band called Anamika, sang in Swahili that night. They were from Coventry, uh, a band called Red Rose. <coughs> there was awards in between the performances being given out. Uh, who else? Bremi, Azad, Afna Sangeet, Hira, uh, Alap with there as our DCS. 
Hole Hole. Um, yeah, man. Incredible night. Just loved it, right? Yeah, I mean, that, like, it, I was trying to, I think, I'm trying to remember, like, some of those bands that the first time I heard them in my car. What was it? What was your first album that you went and bought? Or did were you able to? Because your dad was probably getting them. <laughs> anyway. The first album, I, the first song I actually remember as a kid was Babi and Babi. I used to sing that from a lot. Mm. That was kind of like my growing up song. Um, I guess first album I actually bought. Has anyone ever yeah. asked you this, by the way? No. <laughs> That's so, why it's the bandwagon. <laughs> so, so the first album I bought would have been, actually, I know what it is now. It was Apache Indian, Move Over India. I bought it on tape. So, I, so the first thing I ever bought was that. And then after that, I used to buy loads of Bollywood stuff. Um, so uh, like my body collection from the 90s is, is incredible. Um, and then whatever Bongda bits and pieces, um, you know, if my dad couldn't get hold of, um, yeah, I'd just kind of plug in as best I could. A lot of people think I got everything. I was like seven, eight years old. Like, what, what am I supposed to do? Like, yeah, that, 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 bit, that bit, like, we got something in common. My first album, uh, my mummy actually bought it for me, was, uh, no, actually, I had the uh, Boom Shake Shake the Room. Yeah. The Will Smith one. That was a single, I think. Yeah. And then it was Nuff Vibes by Apache. The white cover. Yeah, white cover. Yeah, yeah. White. And then, and then the first album that I remember that met, I, I kind of went, I don't know, I, I could be just talking, it could be a matter of months, but if I, I went away from Pongola for like yeah. a bit. And then the album that I heard and made me think, what the fuck is this? Was a uh, 100% proof by Punjab BMC. Yeah. When I heard that, I was like instantly in love. I was like, this is, I couldn't believe it. I'm, that's the only album that I've bought like repeatedly like okay. six, seven times like ridiculously I've bought it loads of times and, so my, uh, my version of that would be Hira's Jaguala Mela which I've got on vinyl cassette CD signed by Kuljit Tomra and I bought it on iTunes um, and I dubbed it as well so yeah so mine is Jaguala Mela by Hira I love that man my first that, mainstream, my first mainstream cassette. That you know what? <laughs> do the Bart man. So, so <laughs> it's mad, man, because it's like as I said, like I'm plugging your YouTube channel as much as I can. I mean, like honestly, you got to see some of the footage on there. I like sometimes I kind of like cut little pieces and send it after that. Up and up, I do. I ain't gonna lie. And uh, so it, that's what it, to be honest, that's what it's there for. So look. I've been sitting on content for years, right? So dad's been collecting stuff over the years. I've been sitting on it for years. And it was always a case of one day, I'm going to share it. And that's been a positive of the pandemic, I guess. Um, not having events, not having gigs, not great. Cause I've got bills to pay. But you're sitting there going, oh, what should I do now? Oh, actually, yeah, yeah I was going to do that, wasn't I? Um, and during the pandemic, I just started dubbing off old videos and stuff. I've got loads more. I mean... Did he did, did it bring up like one of the so I'm kind of asking this as a, like a fan as a, as well like you know when like you, you've come you've come your, your your dad's come home and he says like look the band's finished like up and I see you did finish to that point you're su you're a super fan already in there yeah. the only equivalent I've got of that is like when B21 like, I remember that it was all over Radio XL like yeah, yeah, this yeah. is you this should. is was it long over oh, long over you was it long over you yeah, long over you as they did that there was a that press came, release so long over you came out at the same time as Valley's dark and direct which was which was like a, a cut and shut job and it was like yeah B twenty one split so what hell what yeah it was like <laughs> oh here's the album and, and by the way here's a press release of saying they've just split yeah. up at the same time <laughs> and I was like uh, what am I doing there. Um, <laughs> So, like, you know, the, what was the kind of knock-on effect in terms of, like, for you? Um, so, what, 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 14, 15? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, you kind of like... Is it it's a bit be... of an unfair question, just in case, no, like, I just no, didn't know whether it did. In my head, it was like, why are they splitting up? What, 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 what's the need? They don't need to split up. But, okay, if they are going to split up, um what's dad gonna do now like is that it is he gonna get a normal is he gonna get a normal job is he what's he gonna do like i had no idea so at the time he still had his recording studio with kajaran um 
and it was still busy, but it was like, oh, what are they going to do? Um, I guess public opinion, like, they just, basically it was, that's yeah, what yeah. they were told. Don't worry about the, the band. It's okay. And that's where Apna group yeah, came, came from. from. And then they switched it back to Apna Sigita. Um... Again, because like people just kept saying, Apna it, it is, it genuinely is the people's band. So oh, it, they are the best, like I would say for me, they are the best band that was, that's been around in, in, in the UK, UK Pongra at the time from there. And then I give the award that anything that Bhutu was in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that includes Satra, Sofri, yeah, Jazzy, yeah, yeah. everyone. Like, any, anything for me, when he's in there, it's like, that's it, that's fine. If, yeah, if, if, you, see, fine, if you see Bhutu playing keyboards, you're having a good time. <laughs> you know, I, you know. I love, I love, I love that guy so much. Um, but yeah, Apna Singhi was, it is the people's band. Like, if they want to call him Apna Group, fine. Take him. Did the look again there, take him. Uh, if people want to call them up and say, all right, <laughs> Tigia, say whatever. Ultimately, you know, Gillen Pamara, up and say, up and agree, whatever you want to call it, however you want to call it, you know, they're there for the people. Um, yeah. They've got no airs and graces, you know, um, and they've seemed to st- struck the perfect balance of being legit stars um, and normal people at the same time. Um, you, you see, I say this uh, many times, you see Sadara. Uh, um, Steve's discount in West Brom market, you know, on the rare occasion on a Saturday, and it was like seeing Daljeet and Jali at their height, just walking through. It was unbelievable. Yeah. You could always spot yeah. him because obviously his hair was is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, what I mean, so it's just like you know, it still kept it fair play, and um, you know, you just realised the magnitude of these guys, and it, it was crazy. Um, okay, enough of that loving now from from that. Big, uh, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so <clears throat> you, you've gone into into the music. What what was your um? How did you get into radio? Um, I was again that intrigue thing. So as a kid, um, I just used to have this box radio thing, and I had a problem as a kid. I couldn't go to sleep without music. Um, so what would happen was my mom would either. Uh, <laughs> should really obviously start by putting Shabbat on and then it kind of progressed into mum can you just put like whatever pump up the bungara can you put that on please <laughs> so I'd be going to sleep listening to bungara albums um, and then it was the radio so I'd always listen to the radio and, and back then it, again it just intrigued me so when you're watching on TV you can kind of got okay so that's the person they talk to you that's where they are that's the setting okay but in radio uh, there's no pictures anywhere there was no uh, magazines that you could buy only if you could you couldn't afford it um but they were playing music and you had these characters and you had this voice of somebody and how is this happening why is this person doing that how did how is this happening like literally in my head this is amazing and i'd be every single night i'd be listening to the radio um and if it wasn't Ajkal on a Friday night, religiously, it'd be Radio 5 at the time. Not 5 Live, it was Radio 5. He used to take different feeds on different places. Um, Asian Network at the time was local radio. So uh, from 7 o'clock onwards, it'd go from Radio WM to, to Asian Network. And I'd listen to that during the night. Um, and it just always intrigued me. And, and how I got into it... Um, and again, people might go, oh, it's boils down to who you know, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, there is partly who you know, but then ultimately who you know ain't going to keep you in a job because you've got to know what to do. Uh, so for me, it was, um, I used to play, um, there was a, a Punjabi show on the network, which Nilu Kalsi used to do. So for a Vasaki session, uh, us kids, we all, we all went in and that was the first time I went to Pebble Mill and I was just like, Ah, listen, I'm in heaven, man. This is this is what happened. This is how it happened. That's Neil Lukalsi. Like I hear on the radio, then so we did a performance. That was great. And there was a, there was a chap there called uh, Mukan Mukan Benisser, and uh, he used to work at Natural Records as well. And he kind of saw that, you know, I had a bit of, you know, spark. 
there was something there um, and he kind of said to my dad, you know, tell him to come around, Munda Ajavi, you know, at that time it was a bit more informal. So I'd, you know, I'd pop along and then um, there was another lady there, a good family friend, uh, Saab Lote, and she was like, oh, I'll pick you up, I'll take you. Um, and like between the two of them, you know, they're like, okay, go and get tea, go and get water for the presenter, write this request down, pick up the phone, write down the name, the area, location, what the request is, type it through, send it through, and then my company be like, why don't you just come and help me here, wrap up some wires. So that's what I, I was the tea boy. Mm. Um, and I was more than happy to do it. So literally for a year, year and a half, I just used to go in uh, as much as I could, sometimes five times a week, just to observe and learn. And that's how it happened. I, I started off as a tea boy. Um, and, you know, I'd go for free because I wanted to. Uh, and for me, it, was, it wasn't, and I didn't never wanted to be a presenter. At that point, being a presenter was not an option. Even later on, it wasn't an option. But just to, to start off, I, yeah, it was good times, man. I love it. I'm just thinking about it now. It's, it's actually making me emotional, man. Um, just knowing what you're doing now and how it started. Yeah, man. I, I, it's, it's something that I look back on with a lot of pride, man, from T-Boy to presenter. There's not many people who can say that. Mm. You put in the hard yards in, in terms of like from doing it and then, and as you said, almost uh, two decades later, still, still having one of the kind of the uh, premier shows on the on the on the Asian network is like it's it's a, it's a huge achievement. And, and and I don't think there were kind of people or an industry to kind of like pay tribute to that. And say oh, you know, well done, well done. That's you know right. what I mean? It's all right. I, I think it is because no one if, if when like if if no one's gonna say, who's gonna say? As long as the audience is happy. And the boss is happy. That's all I care about. Mm. Genuinely, that's all I care about. Um, because if I was doing it to get acknowledgement from the industry, I'd be playing, you know, the most classical elements of music just to say, look, I know you could play that and I know you're into this kind of music. No, I don't. Mm. Not for me. Uh, and whether the industry like me or not, that's a byproduct. Mm. Uh, whether people appreciate me or not is a byproduct. My role now, from being a tea boy, from being a telephone announcer, from you know just helping out in the office, um, I, what else have I done? Um, I've uh, been the assistant producer on shows. I have produced shows. I have been the studio manager. I've worked on the playlist team. I've done all this. I used to do the imaging at one point. So I used to do all the eye dents and stabs and music beds and all this kind of stuff. So I did all that. Um, and then I fell into the presenting. Um, but then I had to make a choice. Do I want to be staff? Do I want to be talent? Do I have enough conviction in my, in my work to do it? And I left my job my full-time job to become a presenter full-time um and it's been like that for nearly a decade now mm -hmm. you know you talked about being producer uh you know from behind the scenes in in, in the asian network your your journey evolved into kind of music production how did you get into uh, into that Bali jackpot be um, your finest <laughs> so i still remember it so it was yeah, 1999, Boxing Day. And we were at Bagley's. Uh, it was a gig there. Just off um, Broad Street? No. No, no, no. This was London Way. Oh. Bagley Warehouse. I knew the other Bagley. <laughs> and, uh, and anyone who remembers, it was really tight at the back. And um, I, at that time, I didn't really, because I was young, um, I didn't really, I, well, I didn't drink. Well, didn't smoke, didn't do anything, which made me the boring, geeky kid from up and Geet. No one really spoke to me. Keyboard um, warrior. <laughs> it's the original keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I was, a, I was a geek. Like, none of the musicians really, other than, yo, how you doing? Was, no one spoke to me, um, which was cool. Um, and um, I was kind of coming out just to see the next band perform. And I bumped into Bali, and he goes... Uh, you're a bum wrestler, aren't you? Go, yeah, 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 how you doing? You're right, yeah, yeah, cool, 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 cool. And he just randomly goes, do you do music production? Like, I don't know. This is Barry Jackpot, 99 peak. Peak. 
Pete. <laughs> yes. Right. And he goes, do you do music production? No. And he goes, you should, you know. So, okay. He goes, yeah. he goes I've seen you play keys. He goes, you're really good. Uh, okay, okay, cool, cool. And I'm fanboy. And he goes, listen, I've had one of the biggest songs, Ida Sonia, and I can't play keys. And if you can, if you can, you should be able to do it. You should do production. I think you should do it. Okay. And I was like, Dad, I'm just going to go to the studio if that's okay. Nothing, I'm just going to try and do some stuff. And that's that's how I kind of got into it. I mean, like, Bali Jack, like you just said, like, we just said it at the same time, peak. Like, <laughs> yeah. that guy. It, 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 again, like, he used, to have, he used to have a 406 then. I, we, we always know his car and that as well. And he used to have his, his blonde highlights and stuff in it. It used to be. Used to be smash. Everyone was doing their dance moves. Well, to be fair, all the B twenty one, just see you are well, like doing all the all the all the dance moves and that. But like when they when they whenever you see them on stage, they were that something, was, you know, it was something else. But again, for me, that's where it started. Um, I didn't have a desire to do production. I didn't have a desire to be a DJ. And the person who convinced me to become a DJ was my dad. Mm. What, was your, what was your first uh, music? Uh, production that you actually did because just want to say like at this point like you've got your own personal releases and that but there's a lot of stuff that you've worked on people's background as well and you, yeah like, uh, you've you've uh, you've uh, you've been credit for credited for not being credited for like yeah. you've contributed on a lot of lot a lot of music uh i should shout about it a bit more i just can't be asked like genuinely, like it sounded worse than me at this point and i'm a, you know, I'm, a I'm a misery like look, people say like you should say you don't. I was like, yeah, I probably should. I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. Like for me, if it's <laughs> done, it's done. What am I doing tomorrow? That's more important to me. Um, so my first production was uh, commissioned by Oriental Star Agencies, Mohammed View. And my first actual production was an eight-track album of Nath's of Islamic devotional. That was my first. Uh, ever production. Uh, it was an album called Aka um, Kakarte, and uh, I think the gentleman's name was Nas Nasir Manid, I think. I've forgotten. That. But that was my first production, and like it blows people's minds. Like, ah, how, how, you, that was your first production. And the way I see it was Muhammad the Yuba, amazing guy. The amount of time and effort. And trust he's given artists is incredible. Like, Pump Up the Pangara wouldn't have been an album if he didn't sanction studio time for Pradesi to go and experiment. Like, that's the level of, like, there wouldn't have been an industry if Mohammed the Youth didn't step up and say, I'll distribute it, you know? So, props to that guy. He, he's somebody who deserves a hell of a lot of um, acknowledgement and adulation. Um, but for him, he, he goes, yeah, go, go on, try it. And for me, it was a blessing. Like, to produce something that's spiritual and religious as your first project, like, and it's not even your faith, mm. but the people of that faith have faith in you. Yo, that's, that, for me, that blessed way to start, man. So that was my first production. Um, and then from there, look, I ain't no superstar producer, never have been, never will be. Um, and back in the day, my stuff was a bit ropey because you're learning, and I'm cool with that. Um, I did songs without bass lines because I couldn't play bass. And I was like, I was too but scared. You had to go, you had to go. I was too scared to ask people, like, you should be able to do it. But I can't. So what do you do? Don't play bass. The DJs can mix it in themselves, you know? So <laughs> that, my thinking was completely messed, but now, you know, I can I can bang out beats and tracks and songs in a day. Um, and I'm proud of that. Whether I'm the biggest or the best, the award-winning or not, it doesn't bother me. I'm just happy in the place that I am. Like, I can't explain how terrible I was and how nervous I was and how much lack of confidence I used to have as a kid and how that's developed and... For me, that's the success. I'm I'm more than happy with that. And now I'm in a position where I now teach kids mm. how to make music, how to play music, how to produce music. 
and I get a, I get joy out of that on on a different level now. And is that, is that from your hype lab, your 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 lab? Um, yeah, yeah. So I've got my so for the last yeah. So for the last um, uh, two three years, actually four years now, um, I've kind of got my own music academy. Um, it's not something that again I shout about a lot, but uh, what I do is I I go to schools and do workshops with kids um, and kind of introduce them to instruments. So whether it's I don't know steel pans or uh, African djembe drums or ball drums, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, so I'm kind of introducing them to music and getting them to do rhythmic patterns and things like that. And um, more recently, I've been working with um, children who have learning difficulties. And again, that's something that I'm learning now, you know, as a teacher, as a tutor. Um, and it's really, it's, it's amazing. It really is. So you've got these kids who have been told by mainstream schools that we can't teach them. Oh. And, you know, they're not going to learn anything. They're disruptive. They're this, that, and the other. So they're in private school and private education. And here I am, I go with my laptop and I'm saying to them, right, what do you want to do? What kind of music are you into? Oh, I'm into rap. I'm a rapper. Okay, cool. Let's write. So, you know, he'll give me words and I'll start writing a rap for him and I'll get him, this is how I want you to say it, this is the flow, right, let's make a beat, how are we going to do that? Okay, you, you tell me what you want to do and I'll fix it as we go along and I'll teach you. And now you've got a kid who's not been in school for four years, who's now rapping and he's done it in the space of a month. And I'm like, yo, this is crazy. And it just shows me that there's talent in everyone. There's talent in every, like, people, even kids who have been disregarded, man, there's talent in them. And I get such a buzz out of, out of teaching, man. And, you know, I just want to be able to do the things that I had a lack of confidence in asking. I don't want other kids to be like that. I want them to come up to me. And not just seeing kids, geez, I, I, I want to reignite the passion in people who have lost it. Like, I want to be able to take someone who had one or two albums or a couple of hits and over the last 10, 15 years just feels lost. Like, why should they feel lost? Like, is that, you, do, you, do you feel that it, what, what do you, what do you mean like lost in terms of like in the Bhangra industry or just in general, in life? If we take the Bhangra industry, for example, or the Asian music scene, um, everybody has their moment in the sun, you know, as a star, everyone has their 15 minutes of fame as such. And, sometimes time or luck or decisions you make kind of affects what happens to your career. You know, not everyone here has a, a Malkit Singh, Apna Sangeet, uh, DCS, Jazzy, Shindar, Punjab BMC level career where you're top all the time, right? But that doesn't mean the remaining 90% are not worth anything. Mm -hmm. And I think what's happened over the years is People have done stuff and it's come out. Oh, yeah, I've got some radio players on TV. <clears throat> had a good song and sometimes it gets played and it's brilliant. And they've kind of gone, what's the point? Why do I need to make it? No one's playing me anymore. No one's doing this. I don't know what to do. I don't know what music is working and what isn't. And for me, I want to, A, and I'm going to be doing this this year. I've got a project that I, that I want to launch and it kind of hopefully should help in that to help kids at a grassroots level give them all the tools that they need to express themselves because i think that's important for them to express themselves but just help them along the way and almost take people who have a passion for music who have done it who may feel a bit lost who may feel a bit disregarded and kind of say right come here what do you want to do mm. let's bring you back to grassroots what made you happy what kind of music made you happy what was the music that you want to make let's make it don't get bogged down with the likes and the streams and this that, and the other because ultimately we none of us got into music for that yeah you bought albums because you wanted to be entertained and enjoy it you made music because you enjoyed making it don't get bogged down by the business side of things and the social side of things let's make music but, but how let me help you do that but how frustrating is it then well, i don't know whether it is frustrating then that you see like our class you probably is more like a Punjabi purist in that way, yeah. Punjabi uh, uh, purist in that way. But those people who've bought the fake likes, got those millions of views and all this, et cetera, et cetera, they're the ones who are getting, everyone knows it's 
it's bullshit. Some of these figures, yeah. We all, I think that's a, that's an acceptable lie that everyone agrees. But then when you see big organization radios and and plugging those artists, um, because they got these views, and then no one turns up for their gig. You'd hopefully thought that they learned their lesson, but it's a repeated mistake again and again and again. Like, how do you feel, especially like knowing what your your what your role is and what your job is, where you've got to find that balancing act? So the way I approach it um, is, it's the philosophy that I've always had, and I'm confident and comfortable enough to do this. I will play everyone, and I'm pretty sure. I'm probably one of the only people that will play everyone, give everyone an opportunity. Um, I don't base my playlisting, for example, on um, likes, views, streams, hype, legacy, history, uh, relationship. I don't base it on that. If I don't know... Or video quality. Yeah. (laughs) Honestly, whether you have a video or not, I don't care. Because for me, if you have taken the time and effort to make music... You deserve to be heard. And if I can facilitate that, great. Which means if I play you and someone picks up on it and they get in touch with that person, yo, I really like you tune back straight away. That person got a little bit of confidence to go back and make another one. Mm. If I play a tune that has no video because the guy can't afford it or the girl can't afford it, but that gets played and 10 people go out and buy it or stream it or whatever and they get, I don't know, 20 quid, 30 quid, 50 quid out of those streams. They're sitting there going, oh, I actually made something? Okay, well, what about if I take that? And So for me, we need to get out of this funk as society that your video might have, you might see a video on YouTube which has 200 million views, which is great. Full However, sport. <laughs> However, there's around about 20 million Punjabi speakers in the world. And not everyone listens to Pongra music. Um, so we need to kind of get away from that. If you want to be an artist that wants to buy fake views, go for it. If it helps you in your life and makes you a satisfied individual, go for it. I get hard daily views and streams, but I'm just making a living out of it. How does that work? Mm. I've never had a million views. Actually, I have. I've had a million views. <laughs> there on, we go. A, a, one, a one song, the longest one. I was going to say that. Which I don't own. <laughs> <laughs> which I don't own. I've never met anybody from. Um, but everything else, um, it's paying my bills, man. Mm. And, like, I don't need a millions of billions of views to do that. So that's what I want to try and get into artists' heads. That, buddy, Benji, Ghana could do. Put your mm. song out there. Don't look at the views. Don't yeah. care about the views because they don't matter. They legit do not matter because if someone hears your tune and they book you for a gig, that's, that's the only thing that matters. Being booked for events, whether it's a small event, which I think a lot of them are going to be now because of the COVID pandemic situation we're in, a lot smaller events, they want smaller acts. So if you can go with a, a four-piece band, brilliant. But you've got to have the material to go with. Mm. Um, so for me I, I can I, I can kind of see the future and where we're going and what needs to happen there's massive gaps there are massive massive gaps and we've got the talent pool to plug those gaps you don't have to be played on radio to be a success you don't have to be on TV to be a success you don't need a million views to be a success trust me on this because me I've made a career out of not doing any of that my songs don't get played on the radio sometimes um i don't make videos i don't get billions of streams but then how am i making a living out of Bhangra music it's doable it's you've got to get out there you've got to be a performer um and that's what i want to try and instill into people those who are starting out and those who have had an experience of it i just want to level it up so that's that's my plan it ain't dead I'll keep. I'll keep reiterating it. It's not dead. No, man. I, 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 I did. I don't know if I said it was dead. No, you haven't. No, no that's fine. Okay. When I get an, when I get an opportunity to say it, I'm yeah. gonna. I I will keep saying it. It's dead for dead people, and I mean dead creatively, uh, dead in the sense that 
they're not putting the effort in. If you're not going to put the effort in, you're going to get nothing out. It's like with anything. Yeah. If you're not willing to sacrifice, you're not going to get anything. So we've got a lot of talent here. Man. Yeah. There's a lot of talent around the world. And yeah, we're in a good place. And I just want to help people along. Speaking of someone who's like talented and you've worked, you know, worked with very closely early on in their career, was like Gary Sandy. And like you can see him having his kind of his meteoric rise, and like now he's you can see he's one guy, you know how you were talking about being experimental in terms of like your your styling, in terms of how you're doing your presenting, etc. He's one who does that for with music. Did you have um, any indication of that with your experience when you were working with him? Um, so my first meeting with Gary was when he was a waiter and he was trying to find his way in life. Um, I was asked uh, to play his tune because no word the radio station was picking up on it. So, you know, can you... I said, yes, yeah, so. So uh, I played Manny Pinza first. Um, did his first interview. He was terrible. But that was his first interview. He was nervous. Uh, and by the time I, uh, we kind of started chatting and stuff, there was, there was always something. They talented writer. He's got a spark, man. He's got that X factor. There's something there. It just needed, just needed a kickstart, which he got. And by the time Dil did it and Bar came out, at the second interview I did with him, um, like he was, he was next level. He, he, he was off and running. And you know, I'm not gonna I'll sit here and say we're best mates. I, I haven't spoken to him in years. However, I watch what he's doing. I see what he's doing. I play what he's releasing. And from where he was to where he is now, nothing but respect, man. Right. Like, he's had ups and downs on, I think he's probably the first artist to have his whole life um, scrutinized as an artist from start to finish. Um, you know, from being detained, from being deported and, and kind of coming back, you know, it's a it's an amazing story and credit to him. Like he could have just gone shut up, but why why do I need to do this? But he didn't give up. He kept mm -hmm. trying, kept experimenting, um, and he just had he just had confidence in 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 himself. And if you have confidence in yourself, it's going to work at some point. So again, yeah, he's, you know, I haven't spoken to him in years, but he's done he's done except, exceptionally well, and long may it continue. I I, um, I wrote down one question for this whole interview. I haven't ever done uh, written down many things in any any of the podcasts I've done. Okay. I remember having a conversation with you. I think it was at Diljit's launch party or something like that. It was some, something to do with Diljit. I can't remember okay. where it was. And uh, I think either you made the announcement or someone was there that there was an Opera Singit album, this long awaited album, it was going to be done. Or there was like a Millennium Mixes uh, version that was going to be done. Did I say Like that? a refix, yeah. Did I say that? You're doing the same face now as when I did the doll case, so I'm really panicking at this point. <laughs> um, mm. was it was there was there ever a, oh okay, maybe I reframe it then. Is there ever a chance now where you were talking about bringing some of the old school and bringing it together of a of a new uh, of a new album or a kind of a greatest hits uh, revisited? I don't think they're in that place, if I'm being honest. Um so if 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 both of them were to turn around and say, uh, can you do it? <sighs> yeah, of course I'll do it. But they've got to be in that place. They've done nearly, mm. oh, what, 79, nearly 40 years, man, together. And I think they're at a place now where, you know what, it's a lot of effort to go to studios. It's a lot of effort to write new songs, you know. Mm. Um, and if a gig comes along, they're going to knock it out of the park. Mm. That, you know what I mean? Like, so where are we now? 2020, it's coming up to July. Geez, they've already got three gigs <laughs> in July. And that's just where they're at now. You know, I would love to do it. I think I could do it justice. I did, I did an album actually in 2015. It's more of a passion project, never got released, but it was a passion project for me where I wanted to recreate the original sounds of my favorite bands um, and get them to, to sing a track on it. Um, so I had like you know, recreated the sounds of Shake Your Pants and Got Cylinder and Budane. Um, I had, you know, recreated the sound of, you know, Odina, Odina had Bremi Yol do a song on it. There you go. See, look, I went too far away. 
um, I did, uh, I recreated the DCS doing it bullion and caught shin on it, but I never released it because going right back to the beginning of Archer, uh, you got to evolve, man. So this is a project that I now sit and listen to my myself going, yeah, I, I, I did what Deepak Kajanchi did and I did what Kuljit did. Um, and what you know, Pete Ware did, and I'm happy that I'm I've got the knowledge and the and the ability to do that. But ain't nobody gonna listen to it. Um, oh, come on, man! That's like no, no, no. Giza, no. Honestly, no, no one's gonna listen to it. No one's gonna listen. But how do you? Not, like, but it's just, all right. No, no. I got, I got. Go, 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 go. No, you're saying you say that no one's gonna listen to it. But then you're you're exactly like the the older artists that you're saying, the older artists where they've kind of. No, but I'm being a realist. Yeah, no, but, no, no. The, but no, there is a, there's a market. No, there I listen. I listen to Heart Radio. I listen to Smooth. I want to hear this. There, there isn't there isn't anything wrong with putting out. Like I'll always put out music, but sometimes you've got to look at yourself and go, Do you know what? This is for you, man. Like for example, ah, fair enough. So for example, my dad wanted to do when so when Shaka Ali passed away. My dad, I like, was a massive fan of him, and he goes. Mashallah, I was like, okay. And he did it, and I've done a cover version of Shallah. And I'm like, do I want to release it or not? Or is it just something for us? I don't know. You know what I mean? So there's plenty of tracks just sitting there. Um, I don't know. Sometimes you gotta you got to pick and choose. Which is the biggest banger that you got that you haven't released? Probably the Shallah. Probably the Shallah. Um, I might say, I'll send you a clip. I'll, I'll WhatsApp you a clip. Yeah, yeah, you said it. I won't share it, yeah. So anyone who's trying to phone me up after, yeah, fuck you, yeah. There's the... uh, <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, I, might share, I might share it on my socials. Because the thing is, I've done it, but the way I've done it is I've, I've just incorporated uh, elements of um, Shaukat Ali's Shallah, like, music pieces with Kurtas Manshallah. So I've put all right both okay. of them songs together on like on on on, on beats that are right now. Um so it'd be all drill. I'm really proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm really proud of it, but I'm really proud of it, but is it worth a release? I don't know. I don't know. I mean we'll you see. did you did do kind of like a review. Too many samples to clear man. That's the problem. Too many samples, too many samples to clear, too many emails to send, too many forms to fill. I can't be asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I need a manager. That's what I need someone to do that for me. Oh man, I can tell you that yeah, in the in the envious position. No. <laughs> um what was I gonna say? Um what was the other um you I mean during during lockdown you did like a, a project revisit on, on on like four tracks and you like you spun around really quickly. I mean obviously you're kind of revisiting like your thought patterns of where you were a few years ago. Um, did you feel like a natural evolution in yourself of where you would go, where you would do it, where you would um, revisiting some of the pieces of work and thought, right, I need, I could have, I mean, you will all, all be kind of self-critical to a point, but are you more self-critical than others? I used to be. Now I'm at a point where I'm confident in what I can deliver. So the way I would describe myself is, the person you hear on the radio or the person you see on socials is basically me when I was at primary school. That's, you know what I mean? That a full energy, um, laugh, jokes, music, fun. That's me. You know, when I was a teenager, I, was, I had zero confidence. Like, I had no confidence. You know, I'd, I'd be kind of like collar up, hold up and walk through the park, like not chat to my mates when I was at college. Like they'd be having a session over there, I'd be like, can't. You know what I mean? Um, I used to ride buses by myself, never really talked to anybody. I don't think I've got a friend from school. I don't keep in touch with anyone from school, um, just because of the way things are. Um, you know, if I see you, I'm like, yeah, how you doing? Everything cool. Um, confidence from like even when I started DJing. I was the DJ who used to DJ with my head down. When I was with Apna Singh, I used to play keys with my head down. Um, I wasn't the mic guy. Like this guy now talking was scared to talk on the mic. And sometimes you just gotta buck your ideas up, man. Yeah. Um, 
there's a guy in the band uh, with our group, uh, Jatinda, who play, uh, plays Kit, and he was with us for about a year and a half, a couple of years. And I remember one day he just pulled me to one side. He goes, "Why do you play with your kit? Why do you why do you play with your head down for? Play with your head up." Oh, I don't want to, man, because if I make a mistake, then you know, like Uncle Cesaro's going to like screw at me and things like that, and you know, I, don't, I keep making mistakes and whatever. And he goes, and he said to me, <laughs> he goes, "Do you know what? Let me tell you something. As a keyboard player, you're shit. Okay, right?" Oh, and he goes, he goes, compared to the other, he compared to the other art, uh, other keyboard players, yeah, you're shit. But you know what? <laughs> for this band, for this band. This spot on stage where you are right now, this area here, you're the best. He goes, what you do for this band, nobody else can do. No keyboard player. Oh, so compared to what they know and what they've done and what they bring and what they play, yeah, geezer, you're a million miles off. But what you do for this band, nobody else can do. So play with your head up. And I did. And from that moment on, I was like, Damn, damn right, man. I'm the Abnasinki. I'm the Abnasinki keyboard player. Ain't nobody taking my spot. And I just grew in confidence, not arrogance, in confidence. And then I was like, okay, I went from like one keyboard to two. And I was like, can I have a mic, please? I want to do backing vocals now. And I was like, okay, cool. Then you get three keyboards and they're trying different sounds, trying different things. I was sampling and like all this stuff that the band never had. So I was doing all this. Um, and sometimes you just need someone just to give you, you know, a good kick in. Um, there's actually yeah, like I, I cracked that laughing first, but there's actually genius in what you just said. In it, yeah. you, you're the best we got right now. You know, just yeah, I just be. Ain't not, and the thing is, the way he, what he said, nobody can do what you do for this band. Yeah, and I was like, okay, I didn't think of it like that. And um, and from that moment on, I just thought, okay, in that case, I can do it. So how can I get better? How can I do this? So I just started watching other people as I always did and tried new things and just researching it. And you just grow in confidence. Now I'm at a place where I'm like, stick me in any band. I ain't got a problem. Like I'll play with Sofri, I'll play with Shin. I ain't got a problem. Um, and my peers now, uh, I'd like to think they respect me and they see me as uh, on their level. Um, but again, it, it took a while, man. Like I wasn't a confident person. It took, it took a long time to get to, to this point. No. And, and credit to you. I mean, like I, I was, I've seen you perform, and you know how enthusiastic you are. You know, you, you're a person who gives a shit. You know what I mean? So, I just want to kind of go, kind of you know, future gazing. So, like, looked at your kind of your introduction to music. Looked at into the band, your music production, your radio, um, utilizing kind of like let's say thirty, summarizing your thirty years worth of opinion and and, and experience, like. What do you see like the future of Fongra looking like? Um, we, we there was there, I felt there was a bit of shift change in terms of power from UK to India, then India to kind of Canada and America, like you know, our class is the same. So, it, um, uh, you know, I feel like UK, um, is getting I, I, don't, I don't think it's moved too far away from the original sounds that what was going on. Um, do you still feel that way or like rebuke anything that I've just said from there? Um, okay, so uh, if Siddhu Musayala is releasing tunes which has a lot of uh, hip hop in it, great. If uh, Mickey Singh is releasing music uh, which is a lot more urban, great. If Prophecy is releasing music which is a lot more lo fi, great. They all make great music. But when it comes to a dance floor, like this is the key thing here. That stuff ain't gonna get played on a dance floor. For mainstream music, you know, you take somewhere like Glastonbury, that's the that is the peak. Or a club night, you know, that is, you know, back in the day, mainstream sound, IB, so you know, what I mean, those the dance floor is the most important thing. Music expression, creativity, what you want to do, what you want to show, that's really, really important. But the dance floor is the most important. So I love Prophecy's EP Solace. I think it's amazing. What he's done musically, vocally, like lyrically, great. 
but no one's going to dance to it and that's okay so if someone's going to listen to that and enjoy it when they go to a party or they go to a wedding or they go to a club that's not part of the playlist we still need dance tunes and jo marji hove doesn't matter what happens with they see at the corner whether you're you know you got indian heritage you've got uh, pakistani heritage doesn't matter what it is giza when that toll is blasting through the speakers you're going to go on the dance floor it's gonna happen so i think we let's say as the uk yeah there's no need to worry make dance tunes man like there's nothing wrong with it if calvin harris started making drill how odd would that sound you know if um i don't know if david guetta started making i don't know lo-fi like you'd be like okay i want these guys to make dance tunes cuz they dance producers mm. we got bhangra producers make bhangra tunes cuz people want to dance especially coming out of this pandemic mm. like parties are what people want to go to so my thing is express yourself of course express yourself but don't lose the sight of the fact that bhangra music makes you dance bhangra music makes you smile bhangra music puts you in a mood bhangra music creates a lifetime of memories that you're going to watch back again and again and again make that music it might not get thousands of streams or views or we've been through all this before but a dj like me would go i need a dance tune i need a new dance tune i'm playing that and there's plenty of other dj's who 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 want to do the same thing so for me i think the future is just make the music you enjoy and put it out there you know um don't compromise on quality um reach out to people i think people don't do that a lot of that reach out to people invest time and money into yourself but ultimately make the music that makes you happy because that will make people happy people know when you know a lot of love has gone into making a tune if a vocalist is behind a mic and they're not feeling it you you'll hear it you know if a vocalist goes out bang nails a vocal even if it's a rough vocal but when they hear it that like, oh, there's a lot of passion in that voice mm. and it works so i think the future is we're competing on a world level now so do what you're good at and what we're good at here in the uk is making people dance making people smile and making memories that's what we need to do well i don't know why we stopped let's not do that let's just get back into it what it like um like you you took some time away in, as well from it to kind of you know uh, recharge your batteries or stuff what um i don't know if you want to kind of go into that um, yeah it happens um so for me um in 2019 was it yeah it didn't start off the best um so my father in law passed away in january unexpectedly and it just you know you you you, you i started thinking about life like you know he, he worked hard excruciatingly hard to provide for his family hardly got to see them hardly you know what i mean he sacrificed family life for for work life so he could retire and enjoy and unfortunately he never got to that and in my head i was like that's not fair that's not right he deserved it and you know there's so many other people like that um so i started thinking a lot about that um i got involved in a in a project um which took up a lot of my time um it still really gives me nightmares now man it was a, it was a, it was like a theater tour and one day I'll talk about it but right now all i can say is it it in all it is a it we, when you've just put on a show at the alexander theater here in birmingham and you've put all the visuals together you've put the track listing together and it's gone out and there's people there and they're enjoying it but you go home and you're in tears there's something wrong mm-hmm. like there's something wrong and it happened again and again and again 
And um, there were other things as well, just work-wise, just wasn't feeling it either. Mm. It got to the point where the tunes, I just didn't care. I was listening to music, I was listening to stuff that I used to listen to as a kid, and I was like, don't care. And then it was a point where I started getting miserable at home. Um, and my producer, Sandy, ultimately pulled me up and uh, she said, you need to sort yourself out. I spoke to my boss at the time and she goes, listen, what's going on? I told her, I go, do you know what? I wish I could just disappear for three months. I don't want to speak to anyone. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to be contacted. I don't want to be followed. I don't, nothing. I don't want to talk to anyone. Um, and Asian Network were brilliant at the time. They go, how long do you want? I said, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> Give me a month. Can I have the rest of the year off? This was in December. They go, all right, safe. And then we'll revisit it. And I just took a month off. And I did nothing. I just I didn't answer anyone's calls. Didn't get in touch with anyone. And by the second week, I was just like, okay, I can get back into this now. And I think I just realized that since the age of 15, all I'd done was music and all I'd done was media every single day of my life. I don't get to go on holidays. I think since me and my missus got married, we've been on two holidays in 12 years. Two holidays in 12 years. People think it's all hunky dory and yeah high life nackies it's not because when it's summer holidays i'm out on the road i ain't got time to drop gigs and it just caught i think it just caught up and took a month out and it's the best thing i did mm. because i came back in 2020 and the best year of my life yeah i definitely yeah i mean um i didn't really want to push you down that road i was i was more talking about you know when we were talking about the you took a break, recharge your battery, like the industry like did almost kind of felt like it's done the, the kind of the same. But just finishing on your your bit there, I definitely noticed this kind of I know you're a WWE fan, but like a like a uh like a Matt Hardy version 2.0. You know, you, 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 you came you came back like uh like uh, see, a I, think I'm, I think I'm, I think I'm more of a Mick Foley, yeah, yeah, yeah. big yeah, goal yeah, wall, big, big quite, goal wall at the edge, yeah. <laughs> jumped off a cage and or in a tall case. Uh, so yeah, so like I, I definitely noticed when you came back that there was. I'm not saying that you weren't serious in, before, but there was a definite method in the method in the way that you were doing stuff. Like I saw something like your interviews that you done online. There was a lot, you know, I could see this kind of this, you've taken th uh, time out and you've, uh, you know, thought about plans of how you want to set things up. I don't know if the channel was set at that time. I can't remember, but like. Not, um, again, it, I just did a simple thing. Like, so when I say to people, I want to help you from a grassroots level or let's get back to grassroots. It's what I did. So I sat there and I was like, okay, what did I used to do? Okay. I bought went, went to W. Smith and I bought a pad book and a pen. Yeah. I started writing. Okay, what did I do? I used to write a lot. Ideas, things, plans. I used to do all that. And I didn't do that for over a decade because it was always, right, what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next? Um, and I, I just took it back to grassroots. And I started working. I started planning. Um, filtered out the bakwas in my life. Um, to be honest, I hardly socialise. I, I really don't socialise. I'm a bit of a. I might become. A, I'm a bit of a hermit in that way. I'm like, I yeah, you ain't the greatest on WhatsApp. Uh, like. No, nah, I'm a bit of a hermit like that, and I enjoy it because I don't. I don't have to be in the pub every week or be somewhere every week to be happy. Oh, geez, I'm happy at home, and I enjoy it. Um, and then when it's time to perform time to present i'm ready i'm gonna i'm gonna knock it out of the park uh because i know i can so i think i had to rediscover myself i had to re look if you work in an office and you'd been doing it for 16 years every single day of your life you're gonna get to a point where it's like i need a break man. because then you can go back to the same office and go, oh, I'm good to be back. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's all I needed. And I've been saying that to everyone since. Giza, take a break. Dude, mate, take a break. 
you need a break. I think we all do in life. Um, if we're not working, we're we're scrolling. If we're not scrolling, we're stressing. And if we're not stressing, it's something else. And I think at times we just need to literally pause on life. Not stop, pause. Take a pause, disappear for a little bit. Uh, go for a country walk somewhere, head down to Bournemouth, hit the beach or something like that. And just to take time out. Um, I think the pandemic has kind of helped in that way. Um, obviously, it's affected certain families in, in a devastating way. Um, but the, for those who have managed to kind of, you know, keep their families together, it's kind of made you think, right, what am I doing? <laughs> What's happening in life? What's plan B if I need a plan B? So, yeah, for me, I started doing too much, got involved with the wrong people. Um, and my efforts weren't being rewarded and it got me down and I just hated everything and everyone. So taking a break was the best thing I did. And I, and I urge anybody to do it, doesn't matter what walk of life you're in, you need time for yourself. So, uh, Dips, this is, um, this is called The Bandwagon. I do this with every guest uh, that I have on here. Um, so this, I have like, uh, an opportunity that I give to the, to the, uh, to guests to basically jump on any bandwagon that they want, any bandwagon that they want to jump off, um, or just something that they want to raise. This is like your free free time to do it. Huh. A pet peeve, anything, it's up to you, mate. Right? Genuinely. Oh, you're gonna I... be the, you're gonna be the first one to say you ain't have you? No 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 no. <laughs> for me from everything I've, you know, I might, this might sound really cliche, but you know what? We just need to enjoy life, man. Mm-hmm. Find a way to enjoy life. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm 40, but I love watching WWE, man. I love watching, like, I've got back into Desmond's. I've been watching Desmond's. It makes me happy. Mm. Like, so, you know, I've just given kids, they, they were eating bits at eight o'clock. I come into my, I come into my room here. And I'm watching an episode of Desmond. So for 20 minutes, I'm laughing. And then I'm like, all right, kids, let's go. And all of a sudden, like, I'm talking to you about Desmond's and I'm in a happy mood right now. Yeah. That's how you want to start your day. So I think find things that just make you happy. Like whatever it is, whether it's a PlayStation, whether it's baking, whether it's walks, whether it's, you know, something on iPlayer or Netflix or whatever it is. And ultimately now in the life that we live in we've got everything man like if you had to say this to someone 30 years ago find something to make yourself happy well they only had like three channels four channels there was not a lot to do not a lot of money to go around um we've got a lot of things that we should be very very grateful for in life like this pandemic has gone through with everyone having access to everything we haven't lost out on anything in, in, in the sense that we've been able to watch films at home, we can have our groceries delivered, all those kind of things, you know. So there's no excuse not to be happy. Find something that makes you happy. You don't need to follow anyone. Don't follow any trends. Um, this is probably the anti-bandwagon thing. Like, you know, no, don't, don't jump on anyone's bandwagon. No, except, no. I, except, you know what, start your own. No, no, it- Start your own bandwagon. And this is this is one of the points. I just want to say, I, I, like something I, I don't think I ever kind of told you in that, but I remember when I um, ages ago from when I used to do cash and pot, I used to play well polytech or exile yeah. and stuff like that. I, that was the first time I kind of met you, and uh, we stayed in in contact loosely over the years. You know, bits and bobs. Uh, whenever we've kind of met, we were always had a deep, deep bugger conversation. Always, always. Um, and I remember once when I, was, I did something, um, I think Brit Asia needed some football coverage or something like that. And I was, I was just hanging about for some, I can't remember what it was. And I got just dragged into the studio. It's like, here you go, hold this. And uh, it, it went on there. I, you can't see it anywhere now online, so don't even try anyone. <laughs> um, and the first message was like from you. And uh, you said, oh, I saw you on Fingy, like, fair play, you know, keep it up, man. Like. I always had that in the back of my head, like, you know, that like, yeah. this geezer, he's already done it, doesn't need to say something like that. And he come out of it, because I was, like, embarrassed from it. It was, it was terrible, wasn't it? But, like, to do that, to come out, it was always stuck with me. And it was one of the motivations that 
I had loads of motivation to do this. I, I've always listened to podcasts for, for years now and always had it in the back of my mind. I always said, even with Frenzy, that like, we were going to do something. Like, you know, just it was just there. And through whole COVID, it came to fruition. And I always had it in the back of my head. I go, like, you're okay. Like, Dip said it was okay. So it's like, you know, you can, you can do this. So I know what you're saying with the school stuff. And I think it's important that how, what you said, that you, people in positions, whether they are, um, you know, whether they're famous or not, anybody can have an influence by just a sentence or a few words. And that can, that goes so far, so, so far. So I'm not blowing smoke up your ass in that way. <laughs> no, I'm, no. I'm legitly saying, like, I, I remember the conversation. I remember where I was when it was in there because I was like, you know, that was like, that was that was important. The thing is, look, um, you know, I'm not gonna lie to you. I don't remember doing it. Obviously. However, that's something I still do today because if I hear something from someone, I'm like, or see something from someone. Or I see that, oh, I know what they're trying to do, but that thing kind of work out. I'd like to say, well done, wicked, sounded great. Try this, try that, try this. It might work, it might not. Um, if someone's, look, if someone's terrible, well, good. okay, good stuff, all right. But if there's <laughs> something there, yeah, obviously, look, you, it's something that you may not have been comfortable with back then, you weren't happy with. Mm. Um, but I don't know. I mean, we meet up from time to time. I don't know you from Adam. So if I've said to you, it's not coincidence that you're doing this now. Like, <laughs> obviously there was something there. If I've said it to you, there's something there. It just needed you to find it. Just like, you know, Jack told me, play with your head up. You know? Well, Bali got in play, play keys. Yeah, yeah. Bali saying you should produce. Like, you do remember certain things. Um and like the biggest one for me was my dad. My dad would say, Jitanu nahi changa lagda, karke de ka. Well, if you don't want to, then leave it where it is. So, again, geez, I think it's great that you're doing it. Um, a long way to continue. I know it's hard work. I know, <laughs> I, know, I, know, I, know it's, I know it's hard work trying to connect with people and the editing and all that stuff. But you only do it because you want to do it. You only do it because you're passionate about it. And, you know, if it scratches an itch, why not, man? And if it makes ultimately it boils down to that, does it make you happy? Of course it makes you happy. That's why you're doing it. Um, that doesn't mean everyone's going to get it. That doesn't mean everyone's going to watch it or be inspired by it. Oh, but, not everyone watches it. I can tell you that now. But, <laughs> but, but they, the thing is, you, it makes you happy. Yeah. yeah. Spotify, making- to be fair, I'm not joking. Yeah? Yeah. Weird fact here yeah, is like, when well, you can see the. I, I do it on different platforms because yeah, yeah. I, I, the way that I watch and do things. So like, uh, you have your you have your YouTube views and you just put in a comment, but like downloads and stuff. I was like, oh my god! And my missus comes up to me and she goes, "There's people in this world who actually listen to your voice every week voluntarily." <laughs> <laughs> and so when she put it like that, that was the ultimate humbler. Because <laughs> I was like, she goes, she was like, because. There's people listening to you and actually think that you're clever. And I was, <laughs> I was like, no. But, you know, it's mad. You just realise how big the, the, the world is and how big this whole kind of platform. And I know, like, you know, your potential in, like, in this arena is, like, you know, it's there, man. Because I know you've, you've, you've done it. And I, I've watched your interviews of when you were doing it. I've, I've learned a lot of stuff as well. So, like, uh, big, shout, big shout out to you, man. No, nah, listen, look, it's all good. Ultimately, I'm a fan. I'm a normal geezer who's doing an extraordinary job. Um, and I I fully acknowledge that for many people um, in this line of work that I am the glass ceiling. Um, and, I, and I don't take it for granted. You know, I still have to work harder. I still have to maintain. I still have to evolve. And, you know, for as long as ultimately it's not my dad's bbc so at some point the call's going to come and whenever that call comes you know i'd graciously go no problem because someone else has to come and do it and that's how it should be um but i'm always going to be the guy who if i'm not front and center doing what i need to do i'm more than happy to stand at the side listen watch and go yeah well done 
that, that, you know, and ultimately it, that makes me happy. Be happy, man. Find something that makes you happy and do it. So that's the only kind of, I don't know, sensible thing I can leave you with. No, as the as the wrestling terminology, you you got them over. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's it. All right, Dibs. Really enjoyed it, mate. Appreciate uh, it. Thanks. No worries, man. Take care, brother.